This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Take Control Books, the answers you need now from leading experts. Learn more and download yours at TakeControlBooks.com. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, it seems a couple things that we all have in common. We all need more storage. The other thing we have in common is that we're all moving to the cloud in one way or another, whether we like it or not. Sometimes it's it's super convenient, and sometimes we're not always comfortable with what we store there. Uh, Jim Sherhart is back from Transporter to talk about why their device, and especially their new Transporter Sync, can give us a little more security in that way, and maybe this time around not cost us as much as even it had before, and they were making it really affordable. Jim, it's great to have you back. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chuck. Always great to be on the show. So we should start out with the new kit on the block, the Transporter Sync. Sure. What's the Transporter Sync, and why should our viewers and listeners care? Yeah, so, well, you're very familiar with the Transporter, but just to kind of recap for everybody else, the, uh, you know, the Transporter connects via Gigabit Ethernet, and it has an internal drive. Um, and it's a two-and-a-half-inch drive, so it's limited currently to two terabytes, you know, based on the drive technology that's available. And so, of course, I mean, and this even goes back to the original Kickstarter campaign we did a year ago. Um, one of the biggest requests we got is, you know, hey, can I use, you know, bigger drives? Can I put more than two terabytes on a transporter? Um, and the second thing is I've got a stack of USB drives. You know, I'd love to be able to repurpose those. Um, and so really what the sync is, it's more or less a, a cut down version of the transporter that rather than an internal SATA drive that limits you to a two and a half inch form factor, we've now utilized a USB port so that you can put any two and a half or three and a half inch drive um, behind the device. So um, not only can you go up to four terabytes if you're looking at buying a new drive, but you know now if you've got a 500 gig or a terabyte drive laying around that you're not really using, here's a great way for 99 bucks to repurpose that and turn it into a very nice, large private Dropbox, essentially. And when you say cut down, you literally mean cut down. <laughs> um, it looks like somebody took a hacksaw to the, to the uh, regular transporter, chopped off the top of it, put a, a lid on it, and go. Yeah, totally. Um, and so the form factor, I think, is going to look very familiar to a lot of people. In fact, I have one here that I can show your viewers. So there you go. So it literally looks like a transporter with the top cut off. And then obviously, um, if they can see that, the yeah. uh, transporter sync branding on top. And then, you know, in the back, it's going to look very similar to the original transporter. You can see the Gigabit Ethernet port, the power port. Um, this is actually a prototype, so there's no masking on this one, but the USB port on this one. So the original transporter had a USB port that was reserved for an optional Wi-Fi adapter. And so what we've done is some electronics changes and some software changes to repurpose that to allow it to use storage. Um, so, yeah, so it's a, it literally looks like a cut-down version of transporter. Jim, I think that was always a question in, in a lot of people's minds when the transporter first came out. Hey, this is great. This is fantastic. But why did we go with the two inch, two and a half inch drives, which automatically limit the uh, the amount of storage that you could have? Was that a cost decision or were there some technical aspects of a two and a half inch drive that just made it a better choice? Well, I think so. Yeah, there were definitely some, you know, have, when we were thinking internal drive. So, um, the reason we went internal is, is when you're launching a new product, you want to control as many variables as you can. Um, and anytime you're adding things externally, adding cables, it's a, it's a variable you can't control. And so, you know, our thought process was it's a brand new product. Um, there's going to be a lot of software enhancements we're going to need to make. Let's try and limit, you know, any concerns people may have with the hardware, any variables in the hardware. And so we went with the internal drive. You know, static connection is going to give you a better performance. Um, so th there were some there were some technical reasons for doing that. Um, now, why we went two and a half inch is because when it's internal, obviously a two and a half inch, way lower power, way lower cooling requirements. Um, so it just allowed us, you know, because Jeff basically said, you know, from his experience with Drobo, is that you know he'll never build another device that requires a cooling fan. Um, and so that was that was a big design criteria for the transporter is that it didn't have enough heat dissipation to require a fan, and so. Two and a half inch drive work well for that. I think um, I think that having now an external drive capability is sort of a logical next next extension to the product line. Um, now that we obviously are much further along on the software um, and know that the hardware is very robust, so um, so I think it I think it's time. I think it makes sense. You know, and you mentioned earlier that the new price point 
you know, is obviously going to make it very attractive for a lot of people. Jeff, even from day one, said all along he wanted to get this product to be a $99 product. Um, you know, early in the manufacturing process, when you don't have the volumes to justify it and try and get the costs down, it's difficult to do. Um, you know, but uh, so this also gives us another nice price point as well, um, having some of those, because we could remove some components by not having an internal drive. Um, you know, so when you're trying to hit a $99 price point, you know, every, every little bit of cost, you know, makes a difference. When the price point came out, I was sh very shocked and obviously very pleased uh, that, that you could do that because the taking the drive out saves some money, obviously, but you've really made an effort to take this technology, put it into everyone's hands. Because frankly, who doesn't have a USB drive laying around somewhere that could be repurposed for this? And it's it, even even the, the smallest drive is going to be so much more than what you probably have in your Dropbox or any of the other cloud services. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've got a 500 gig drive that I had laying around that, that I've gladly repurposed. Um, and it's a two and a half inch, which is nice because then it can it can be bus powered off the USB port. So that kind of also minimizes cables. But I mean, I think you can get a two terabyte, three and a half inch external drive for about 70, 80 bucks today. Um, you know, so e even now, you know, whereas before maybe the original transporter, some people said very cool. Put it $199 and I got to buy a drive, you know, it's still you know, something I need to think about at that price point. You know, whereas now, you know, you can buy a sink for 99 bucks, you can buy a big drive for less than $100. You know, so for less than $200 all in, you've got more or less a two terabyte Dropbox that you never have to pay a monthly fee on. Um, that's a pretty strong value proposition. I think you're right. I think, I think this will allow it to get into more people's hands, which is absolutely what we want to have happen. Yeah, and, and I want to make sure folks heard you. That's terabytes. That's not gigabytes. That's terabytes. And that's a whole different animal. But of course, that's just where the story starts. We're, we're also talking about privacy here. The idea that my information is stored only on my transporter connected to my computer and then with any other transporters I've shared it with. It's not out there floating on somebody else's servers. Not that I think I have anything the FBI would want, but, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. certainly hackers might be interested in doing it. And those kind of those kind of operations are a much bigger target than my lowly little transporter sitting in my office. Yeah, I think it. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's just one less thing for people to have to worry about. Um, you know, I know when I upload stuff to Dropbox, I have to take a you know, second and pause and say, do I want to have this file up there? Because I know as soon as I put it up there you know, that it's really not mine anymore. And I have to assume that somebody's going to look at it. Um, and so I think for a lot of people, it's just peace of mind, um, knowing that they control the files, knowing that they know exactly where they reside, um, you know, knowing that, you know, nobody that they haven't invited to share those files can actually see them or look at them. Um, you know, it's just a really nice peace of mind. But we, you know, privacy is still very important, but we really felt like we needed to get to a price point now where, um, it's almost just like a no-brainer for somebody. You know, I think, you know, for anybody who is currently paying for a 100 gigabyte Dropbox, they're paying 99 bucks a year. Um, and 100 gigs, you know, they're still having to manage their data, I guarantee it. Everybody I know that has a 100 gig Dropbox, you know, they filled it up pretty quick. And now they're having to manage it again. It's just, you know, it's like the 2 gig free all over again on a different scale. Um, you know, and so I think somebody like that could easily justify $99 for this, um, you know, either repurpose a drive you already have, go spend a few bucks on a drive, um, you know, and now you've got the same capabilities, you know, but you, you don't have to think about what you put there, both from a privacy perspective or a capacity perspective. Now, let's be real clear, Jim. When we say USB drives, we're talking about USB 2, USB 3, we're talking about 5400 RPM, we're talking about 7200 RPM, as long as it's got a USB connector and, you know, and probably not USB 1, folks, but, you know, pretty much anything else, you can stick it in a transporter sink and go. Yeah, yeah, and what we recommend is stay with the, stay with the bigger brands. Um, we have seen a few instances with, with some corner, you know, some smaller brands, you know, less popular devices where... Um, it just doesn't seem to communicate via standard USB. Um, so we've got a we've got a knowledge base article. If anybody's concerned, maybe they've got an old drive and they're not sure if it's supported. We've got a knowledge base article they can they can search for and find that will call out the ten or twelve instances of drives where we've seen some unusual behavior. It'll work. It's just uh, you know it may not be as completely reliable um, as some of the better known newer technology. So, but uh, yeah, I mean in theory, any USB two, even USB one. I mean, why you'd want to do that? I don't know. 
Um, but we have tested some, and believe it or not, they do work. Um, as you can imagine, they're painfully slow. Um, but, uh, but yeah, even some USB-1 will work. So, yeah. And, and that's another point I think is important. You don't have to go out and buy one of these blazingly fast USB-3 drives because we are talking about this being a cloud storage device. So you're, by the nature of it, going to be limited by your Internet speed. And you're probably not talking as much about a file transfer thing where I'm trying to get something to you right away. The idea is going to be put it on the transporter. It syncs up. I send you, you know, a link that says, hey, it, it'll be there as soon as it gets there, and, you know, that's it. So there's probably yep. no reason to really waste money on a, on a USB 3.0 drive for this. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, you know, we, we get that question a lot, you know, why, why USB 2.0? Um, and when we explain it, people say, okay, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I mean, if we put a USB 3.0 port on there, um, people may try and do things with this device it really wasn't designed for. Um, you know, it wasn't designed to edit video, you know, or, or you know, do... Um, you know, very uh, processor-intensive operations that you might try and do with a Drobo, for example. It just wasn't designed for that. And the limiting factor in 99.9% .9 of instances is always going to be the Internet connection. Um, wherever you put this device, it's ultimately going to be limited by your upload and download speeds. Um, you know, so the fact that the USB 2, you know, can only do, in theory, what, 30-some megabytes per second? You know, what we see that, you know, as being maybe where that, where that comes into play would be if somebody wants to stream some video around their house. And the reality is, you know, USB 2 will stream multiple streams of HD video with no problem. You know, so for the use cases that we've designed the product for, we feel that USB 2 is totally appropriate. So it kind of sets the right expectations in terms of how people should use it. Jim, I think this issue may have been a little camouflaged by the very nature of the, of the design of the original transporters. But now I'm 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 going to have a transporter to excuse me a transporter sync on my desk. I've plugged in a hard drive to that, and then somebody comes in and unplugs the hard drive and takes it up and carries it away with them. Do they now have a copy of my data, or is the data encrypted in some transporter fashion so that it, it can't be read easily just by plugging that drive back in somewhere? Yeah, so probably the first thing to talk about is how we format the drive and what somebody could do with that. So, um, you know, when you do plug a USB drive in, and this is an important point, there's a big label on the unit to sort of highlight this. When you plug a USB drive in, the, the transporter is going to want to format it. Um, and it's a Linux-based system, so it formats ext4, if anybody's familiar with that file system out there. Um, so, so, so right off the bat, if somebody was, was to get that drive, um, you know, they would have to have a Linux computer to be able to read it back. Um, you know, so it's, it's in a format that's probably not as common. I, you know, obviously Mac uses HFS plus windows uses, you know, various things, but typically NTFS. So you can't just plug this into a Mac or a windows machine and read it back. Um, you know, the second thing to point out is, is we don't encrypt the drive. So data, I call that data at rest. Um, but we do encrypt the data in transit, you know, so before it leaves the transporter, um, the data is always encrypted and it gets decrypted on, on the device trying to access the file or where the file is being transferred to. Um, but because Transporter shows up as a regular folder on your file system, you can use the built-in tools that are in Mac, you know, or some of the free products like TrueCrypt to actually encrypt the data, you know, as you put it in the folder, just like you would do anything. So, you know, the thing I tell people is, do you currently encrypt your Mac hard drive? Well, yeah, I use this. Well, perfect, because that'll work for Transporter, too. Um, you know, and I think that people take, it, it's hard to get their head around that because they still think of this as a NAS device. Um, you know, but we don't show up as a NAS device, you know, we show up as a folder. Um, you know, this is, you know, we, we took the approach, the ground up approach of, you know, we need to look like and behave like Dropbox because that's how people want to use the cloud. They love, they love the fact that it's a native folder and they've got full capabilities, you know, whereas a lot of the, I think the other private cloud devices started as NAS devices and got some remote access software bolted on top. So they still feel very much like a NAS device that just has some extra capabilities. But ours is, you know, it literally looks just like a folder on your, your Mac. So anything you're using to encrypt the data on your Mac, that tool is going to work just perfect for Transporter too. Okay. And I don't think that's a big issue for the very same reason that you just said. You know, somebody could walk in here, grab one of my other external drives and carry it off. And it's not, unless I've taken the steps that you described to encrypt it, they're going to have full access. So it's it's just not... Not something usual, and the fact that it's a Linux-based format also, you know, it, it, it adds a slight bit of disincentive, I guess. Yeah, and I mean, for people that are concerned about that, like if they really like the product and it's a legit concern, 
we've actually we're working with um, a company that uh, that actually will do secure data center hosting for a small fee every month. Um, and a lot of people are taking advantage of that. It's actually called Transporter Hosting. So we go to transporterhosting.com. If you're concerned about where you would put the transporter, you know, they offer a great option for people that, that might be concerned about that. But yeah, there's a lot of options out there and we've got knowledge base articles about it, you know, how you would encrypt the data, you know, or if you want to host it someplace secure like the transporter hosting folks have done. So, um, so there's a lot of options for people if that's something that they're worried about, which we understand, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a legitimate concern. Sure. So how about the other one? And I've, I want to make sure that folks know that when you were talking about Jeff earlier, you're talking about Jeff Barrel, who uh, started Drobo, started Transporter. Now the two are coming together. Um, we talked to Jeff at Macworld when he, when you all first launched the Transporter. Um, but there's a, a natural inclination for a lot of the members of this particular audience to want to go beyond that four terabyte limit uh, and plug a whole Drobo into this. Uh, the sure. idea that I can have almost all my stuff in the cloud would be very, very appealing. Is there yeah. a reason I, I should or should not do this at that at this time? Well, the, the four terabyte limit, um, it is a soft limit. And what I mean by that is we're only able to test so many devices between you know now, now and launch. Um, it's not to say that that's going to be a permanent limit going forward. Um, so we will test with, with other devices. Um, you know, arguably a Drobo could even work on the back end, but that won't be officially supported at launch. And the biggest reason is there is some software work that we need to do in Drobo um, to make it work properly um, that people may or may not care about. We have, a, we have a service that runs. So, you know, on Drobo, they're data aware. And so when you delete stuff on your Drobo, uh, it frees up those blocks so you can use it for later. So, I mean, I don't know if you, Chuck, you've got a ton of Drobo, so you know what I'm talking about. But for the people out there that maybe haven't seen it, you know, the Drobos have either blue capacity indicators like the little dots or a, a continuous bar that tells them how full the Drobo is. So you can just look at it and see if it's 50% or 60% or 70% full. Um, so uh, there's a service that we run on, on that as you delete stuff to go and, and reclaim those blocks back. You know, we call it cluster scavenger, but that's, that's kind of a techie term. But um, the challenge would be that, that without having a host file system that understands that in front of it, um, it wouldn't necessarily um, work properly. So your Drobo would just continue to fill up even when, if you were deleting files, if you were to use it behind the transporter sink. Um, yeah, that's one of the, the, the technical issues that we have, you know, which may or may not concern people. Um, you know, but there may be some other things. So again, you know, it's something that we're certainly talking about internally and we're thinking about, but you know, we're just being cautious to say it's not going to be officially supported at launch. Because um, certainly one of the things that we're in is we're in the, the world of storage and data protection. You know, so we don't want to do anything that hasn't been fully tested that we feel completely comfortable with. You know, if we wouldn't do it with our own data, we certainly wouldn't want our customers to do it. So, um, so I think the message is, um, technically, could it work? Sure. Um, is it something that I would recommend people do? Um, probably not until it's fully supported. In the meantime, four terabytes will get you quite a bit of data on the cloud. <laughs> four terabytes. Four terabytes will get you a good way. And, and you know, there are. You know, there are some dual drive enclosures out there. You can put RAID 0, you know, that you could have, you know, up to 8 terabytes. You know, so that that's something that's probably on our short list of, of items to test. So I think the 4 terabytes, you know, is a soft limitation that will probably be increasing, you know, fairly soon down the road, as soon as we're able to fully test that stuff. This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Take Control Books, the answers you need now from leading experts. Our friends at Take Control Books have been busy over the past few months, delivering lots of new titles, each one of them a study in effective analysis and training on whatever topic they focus on. I look at Take Control Books as a way to hire some of the best experts in the business to teach me what I need to know about programs like 1Password, iTunes, and LaunchBar, and topics like digital photos, online privacy, and going paperless. The training is concise, effective, and affordable focusing on things I really need to know. It seems like program documentation has gone from the 300-page manual down to the barest essentials. Take Control Books bridge the gap, covering the features and topics that are important, and get you up and running quickly and efficiently. Even better, Take Control authors often engage online with their audiences. And don't forget that Take Control Books often offer an upgrade when updates or newer versions of the programs are released. All that is why I introduce you to every Take Control author about every book released, if at all possible. Authors like Joe Kissel, 
Michael E. Cohen, Tanya Angst, Sharon Zardetto, Kirk McElhern, Jeff Carlson, and many more. They are all that important to your understanding of your tools and to your productivity in a competitive world. Visit Take Control Books now at TakeControlBooks.com. Find something you want to learn more about and see if you don't agree that Take Control Books are among the best values in tech education. Take Control Books, the answers you need now from leading experts. Thanks to Take Control for their support of Mac Voices. Jim, talk for a second about the transporter software and, and its evolution. I know it, uh, in the grand scheme of things, relatively recently, it got yeah. some new capabilities. And this, by the way, is not just for the transporter, but uh, or not just for the transporter sync, but also for all transporters. Right. Yeah. So um, I think we might have talked um, since then, but you know, back in in late May, we announced the version two point zero software. Um, which was a major upgrade. Um, it introduced things like, you know, right-click capability, um, the ability to email links to individual files. You know, so one of the things people were saying in the early going is, you know, the two things really, hey, I, I'm confused about when to go to the management site and when I do stuff on the desktop. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to just share a few files with a friend and, and he really doesn't want to create an account and install software. And so, so 2.0, really got us very much more like a native file system integration, very much like Dropbox um, with full right-click capabilities, and also got the ability to be able to share stuff with people, even without those people necessarily having to create an account, you know, with the ability to email links. Um, we improved connectivity. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that went into that. Um, you know, so now the evolution is turning more towards mobile and how do we enhance the mobile. Um, so we just, you know, put out a press release um, about Android. So we've been talking about Android, but Android's officially on Google Play now. So you can go out there and download the app. Um, you know, the iOS app is now officially a version 2 app that's out there uh, with full photo and video upload capabilities. Um, it's much more reliable. It connects much faster than the original version did. Um, and we'll continue to enhance those mobile uh, devices as we go. But also with Sync, we'll have a new version of desktop coming out when, when Sync actually officially goes out with some new capabilities. And the benefit of that is that it'll go to all users, including the current transporter owners. Probably the biggest thing is we're going to be introducing a concept called special folders. And what special folders will do is, is so just like, like you know, Dropbox, you have to put everything in your Dropbox folder if you want the magic to happen. The current transporter software, you got to put everything in the transporter software for the magic to happen. But the reality is, you know, all of us, we we got files on our desktop. Um, we've got pictures in our pictures folder. We've got movies in our movies folder. You know, we put all our documents in our documents folder. And so there's a there's an extra step that needs to happen or, or a behavior change that needs to happen to get us to start using those magic folders. And so we're introducing this concept called special folders, which will allow people to keep working on their desktop in their documents folder, you know, keep putting their pictures in their pictures folder, but we'll now allow those folders to be able to be part of the data that gets synced um, using the transporter software. So it's really cool. So, so you can continue to work exactly how you've always worked. In fact, you can decide to put nothing in your transporter folder, but yet you could sync your desktop and your pictures folder um, and your documents, you know? So if you think about people that may not understand this concept of having to use a different folder, why do I have to move everything there? You know, I think it's, it's kind of moving towards our evolution of making this product easy enough for anybody to use and convenient enough for a lot of us that may be too lazy to change our habits in terms of how we do stuff. So, so that's a really cool feature. So we got that coming. And in version one of the software, we had this concept of selectively syncing folders on different clients. Um, and it seemed to confuse a lot of people, you know, and we just had a lot of stuff that we needed to fix in version one or enhance in version one, you know. And so when we came out with version two, we sort of put that, that concept of selective sync on the back burner. Um, but now with the new software, we're going to be reintroducing a new and improved version of selective sync that we feel is going to be much more intuitive in terms, of, in terms of what people are doing when they do that. Because we do think it's a valuable feature. You have this ability to have you know, a physical Dropbox with terabytes of storage, but none of us have terabytes of storage on our laptops. You know, so you're going to want some folders on one computer, likely in some folders on another computer. And so we've reintroduced that, but it's much more improved. So, um, so yeah, so I think people are going to be, you know, the version 2.3 uh, Mac desktop software that's out there today is great. And I think the current transporter users are really going to like the enhancements that's coming with the sync release uh, in a couple of weeks. So that'll be the 2.4 release. So we're really excited about it. I just got my hands on it. I just started playing around with it. So 
Um, I really like the new features. I think the, I think the users will as well. Yeah, it, it's something like that can really change the paradigm. And in some ways, it may make it a little bit challenging because we've become so used to doing things one way with the current implementation of cloud services like Dropbox. And now all of a sudden, we get the opportunity to go another way and, and make it even easier. We just have yeah. to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you don't, you literally don't need to change any of your habits when you do that. So, yeah. And, and I like that idea a lot because now I don't, I wouldn't have to keep, say, a project folder in my drop, in my, uh, sorry, in my transporter folder to have it sync. I could just leave it right in my documents folder where I typically keep things, but designate it to be synced. And there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. We're excited about it. So that'll be out probably in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, good news on sync, I guess good news, bad news is um, the original allotment that we planned on shipping is completely pre-sold. So we're expediting additional units. But, uh, um, you know, anybody who pre-orders the device, you know, just, just so they know, I know there's some dates out there like on Amazon, they make us put a very conservative date. Um, we should be able to clear through all that backlog by the end of this month. So Okay. Um, so it's it's coming pretty quick. Uh, we've got we've got a couple hundred of them actually in house here, so that we can start uh, seeding those out as soon as the software gets released. So nice so problem. Think, yeah, nice. it's a nice problem to have. Yeah, nice. really. I think ninety nine ninety nine dollars is really hitting a sweet spot where you know, I think for most people, you know, they, they look at the product like it's too good to be true. It can't do all the stuff. I don't believe it. Um, and at two or three or four hundred dollars, they may say, you know what, I'm going to wait for you know five hundred reviews to come out before I actually believe it. Whereas at ninety nine dollars, I think a lot of people say, you know what, for ninety nine bucks, you know, this is the company that did Drobo. You know, they've continually improved those products. Um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go and chill out ninety nine bucks and give this thing a try. And I, you know, I think people should. It's a great product. It's completely changed the way that I store my files. Um, you know, I mean, I was a Dropbox user before, but I was the classic. I don't really want to pay for it, so I'm just gonna move stuff around and in and out. And you know now I just I put everything on my transporter and it's great. I mean it's a convenience. It, it, it you got you definitely have to think about you know um, doing things a little bit differently. Um, but I think everybody that uses the product will have an aha moment at some point um, where they'll say you know this this thing is really you know it has the capability to change the way that I store my stuff. Well, I I know I love it. I use it. I think you can see it back there i think in, in the picture and, 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 and there are a couple others scattered around different places that i use for both, both personal and work and they absolutely work as advertised i've had no issues um and it's it's a fantastic product and the 99 dollars price point to get you into this the, the biggest danger is i think you'll get addicted because they're so convenient <laughs> so <laughs> We should have said this up front, Jim. You, you all have been very generous in supporting Mac Voices, and, and I really appreciate that. There's also a discount code out there, MV10, that will save you 10% off a of transporter sync. Um, yep. And am I correct? Didn't the the legacy or, or existing transporters go through a bit of a price adjustment as well? Yeah, I should have mentioned that. So you know, part of you know, part of um, I guess just you know having the product out there for a little bit of time, we've been able to get the cost down, we've been able to get the volumes up, and so um, we've also optimized how we do bundles in the channel. You know, so so all that stuff has resulted in our ability to be able to drop the price. So now you know the original transporter for those people who may not remember. So one hundred ninety nine dollars got you an empty transporter, and you could put your own two and a half inch drive. And then a terabyte was two ninety nine, and a two terabyte was three ninety nine. And so what we have now is we've got obviously the transporter sync at ninety nine dollars. That's sort of becoming our bring your own drive device. Um, and the original transporter that was one hundred ninety nine dollars with no drive now includes a five hundred gig drive. So for one ninety nine, you get it with five hundred gigs, and we've knocked the price of the one and two terabyte down fifty dollars each. So that um, now the one terabyte is two forty nine, and the two terabyte is three forty nine. Um, and we'll continue with that product because I think uh, I think for a lot of people. They just want to buy it with the storage. Um, they want something that's completely self-contained. Um, you know, we understand that. And so we, we fully expect the original transporter to continue to do really well. We feel like those price adjustments that we've done are going to help it. Um, you know, but certainly the, the attention now is on the sync product because you hit that magic $99 price point and kind of all the bets are off at, at that point. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jim, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about it. I know you're more than a little busy, especially with that big backlog going. Um, where do we send folks to learn more about all the versions of the Transporter? Yeah, just just our website would be the best place to go. So filetransporter.com. 
Um, yeah, and, and we encourage you obviously to use the code that uh, that Chuck we've given Chuck in the Mac Voices community, um, which will get you ten percent off our online store. Great. Well, again, I really appreciate the support. And, and of course, that's not why Jim is here, folks. Jim's here because it's a great product, period. So, Jim, mm -hmm. I, I can't wait to the next time we get to talk when the next thing comes out, whatever it is, because I know you guys are not sitting on your hands. No, we'll have some, we'll, we'll continue to have some good stuff coming, Chuck. The story will just keep getting better. Good to hear. Great to All see right. you. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. Thanks for having me on. Folks, I'll have links in the show notes to everything Jim and I talked about, a link to the website, of course, use the code MV10 to get 10% off your very own transporter sink. Um, also, a link to the interview with Jeff Barrow at Macworld earlier this year, so you can kind of find out where it was from the ground up and then where they've progressed to, because it's come along very quick. Until the next time, I'm Chuck Joyner, and this is Mac Voices. Thanks for listening. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, app.net, Google+, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date with all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Advertising and sponsorships handled by BackBeat Media at backbeatmedia.com.